It says that they should be keepers at home. They should be good. And then he says they should be obedient to their own husbands. Now, how often do you hear that preached today? Well, if you come to Faithful Word, you hear it all the time. But if you, you, know, if you go somewhere else, you don't hear it so much. But that's what the Bible says. You know, you say, well, that's old, that, that old-fashioned idea. Today, we have women's rights. We've come a long way, baby. And today, you know, oh, those horrible, horrible days when women had no right. Right, let's bring them back. Let's get back to those days. <laughs> what are you so worried about? What do you think they mean when they say women's rights? You know what they mean? The right to divorce your husband is what they mean. You know what they mean? The right to rebel and disobey your husband. The right to divorce him. The right to go out and get a job and make your own money. The right to tell him what to do. The right to go vote for our leaders as if women should have any say in how our country is run. When the Bible says that I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. I am quoting the Bible right now. But it's old-fashioned. Why do you think that women were not allowed to vote until the 20th century? And yet if I get up and say, I don't believe women should vote, because if we're in a democracy which is ruled by the people, I don't want to be ruled over by women. And that's the day we're living in, where Christians are, oh, Palin, oh, Sarah Palin. You say, you're getting political. I'm not getting, this has nothing to do with politics. I don't care if Sarah Palin believed every word in the Bible, which she doesn't, since she believes evolution is real, since she thinks evolution should be taught in schools and, and not creation, since she believes that abortion should not be illegal, according to an interview that I saw that's online for everybody to see. You know, but it's not about politics, because even if there was a woman running for office, are you listening to me, in 2012, that believed that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and she wanted to abolish the IRS and she was just the ultimate candidate that wanted freedom and justice for all, that wanted to do everything that we believe and cut, uh, cut, don't cut them, eliminate all our income taxes and bring us back. I don't care if she was the second coming of Samuel Adams, I will never vote for a woman. It has nothing to do with politics. It has to do with the Bible. It has to do with what's right. And it's not right to have a woman leading the United States of America. It isn't right. It's wrong. Um, also, if you look at verse 5, it's be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And what I really want to point out there is that little phrase, their own husbands. It says that they should be obedient to their own husband. Not obedient to someone else's husband. Obedient to their own husband. Because a lot of people will try to construe the Bible as teaching. Oh, the Bible just teaches that, you know, women have to obey men. No, the Bible doesn't teach that women have to obey men. It teaches that a woman has to obey her man. That's what the Bible teaches. And that's a big difference than to just teach like, oh, all women have to obey all men. That's not a biblical teaching. All women have to be in subjection to all men. No, no, no. A woman is in subjection to her own husband. My wife is not subject unto any other man in this church. None. She's under my authority and, and that alone. And I would never usurp your authority over your wife either. So for example, I've often told people, you know, if I tell you one thing and your husband tells you something else, obey your husband and ignore me because he's your husband. He's your most direct authority and not me because I rule in the house of God here, but I do not rule your home. You rule your home. Every husband is the king of his own castle. That is what the Bible teaches. And so we need to understand when he says their own husbands, that this is a very specific command that the wife obeys her own husband, not just in subjection to everyone. So I got the preaching CD from this preacher that I had heard good things about and wanted to hear. And I got the CD, and this was a guy who had started a church, I think in Alabama or somewhere, and he'd started the church. And I popped in the CD, and about five to seven minutes into the sermon, He's talking about how when he started the church, you know, some of the people on his staff, you know, wanted like the assistant pastor or the, you know, Christian school teacher or whoever. Some of the people, some of the men on his staff 
had said that they don't want their wife working for the church, but that they wanted their wife to be predominantly a stay-at-home wife and a stay-at-home mother, and they didn't want her on the payroll of the church as an employee. And he said, well, that's just not going to work because, you know, we're starting a church. We're doing this great work for God, and it's all hands on deck. And I just pushed eject and just hurled the CD out the window. You know, don't tell the highway patrol, you know, was it like a thousand dollar fine or some crazy thing? But I just, I got so angry when I heard him say that. I just hurled, this is like over a decade ago. I just hurled the CD out the window. What kind of stupidity is that that tells a man, no, it's not enough for you to work for the church. I'm paying you, but your wife has to work for the church too. She needs to be down here working for us. No, that's wrong. She needs to be at home working for him like he wanted as a stay-at-home wife and a stay-at-home mother, not being forced to work for the church. It's like they want to get a two-for-one. You know, they want to pay the husband and get two workers out of it. No. You know what? She needs to be working on breakfast. She needs to be working on lunch. She needs to be working on dinner. She needs to be working on homeschooling the children and, and teaching them and cleaning. And that's enough work. You can't just run people into the ground. Okay, so nothing I'm preaching tonight should be shocking or new or radical. or crazy. It's just Bible preaching right here. I'm just preaching to you what the Bible says. So let's start out in 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says in verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So right away he's exhorting women to dress modestly in their apparel. What does the word modest mean? Well, it means that you're not drawing attention to yourself with flashy clothing such as gold. He, he lists it right there. Gold, silver, pearls, precious, costly array, expensive, costly clothing, fancy hairdos, fancy jewelry, fancy clothing. He said, no, what your adorning should be is good works. That ought to be the adornment. That ought to be the attraction where someone looks at you and says, wow, there is a woman of value it should be her godly life not the dollar amount you know what's the value of this showcase you know whatever you're wearing all the different clothes and all the different fancy things so god's saying you know you ought to focus more on the value of the person not on the outward appearance of just what they look like because of fancy clothes look what it says in verse 11 let the woman learn in silence with all subjection you say what Okay, let me read it again. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Here's the flip side, verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Now, does that sound to you like today's 2011 view of gender equality right there? When God says, well, Adam was first formed, and then Eve. And that's why women should not be in authority over men. Now, I don't see how you could get any clearer. I showed that to a Christian, so-called, one time. And they pointed and said, you believe that? <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. <laughs> of course I believe that. I mean, and you say, well, I don't like that. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. That's what the Bible says. And God is the truth. And let every man be a liar. The God is the one who's right here. And God is teaching us here that men are the ones who are supposed to be in authority and that are supposed to rule. This goes all the way, keep your finger in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Go back to Deuteronomy 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. You see, all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, you'll always see men in positions of leadership every single time in God's economy. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 13. It says in uh, verse 12, How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? Take you wise, what? Men. And understanding and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. And he answered and said, The thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. And you say, Well, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. When he says men there, he's just talking about just people, just mankind. Well, except for the fact that if you read the book of Numbers, 
He gives all those people's names that they chose. He says, okay, and here's the guy that they chose for each tribe to lead and to rule. And he lists each of those rulers. And none of them were named Barbara or Deborah or uh, Judy. or You know, you can just look at the names and say, hey, that's actually a man thing. Because God, all the way through the Bible, starting from the beginning all the way to the end, is consistent with that. And has put men in authority there. If you see it listed there, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. So the Bible reads in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, But the woman, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. See, you couldn't get any clearer here what the Bible just said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that it is not right for women to rule over men. Period. End of story. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Keep your finger in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go back a few pages in your Bible. Ephesians chapter number 5. The Bible reads in... Verse number 22, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. And what's the next word? Even. He says, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, wait a minute. How much would you say that our church should be under the authority of Jesus Christ? I mean, would you say that Jesus Christ ought to be the head of this church? That's what the Bible says. Christ the head of the church. To what degree is he the head of this church? Okay, well, that's what the Bible says, right? It says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. It says, Christ is the head of the church, and even in the same way, the husband is the head of the wife. So this isn't a 50-50 thing. This isn't a give and take thing, where my wife and I, we get together and we vote, and we keep, we keep coming up with a tie. You know, because there's two of us. And so we keep having a tie, so then the children break the tie. No, there's gotta be a leader, and then we had six children, and then the three, the three boys side with me and I'm just, anyway. The bottom line is that there's got to be a leader in that home. And the world's going to tell you, well, you don't have the right to, to, to tell you, you know, your wife what to do or to tell your children what to do or to lead your home. But the Bible makes it clear that the husband is the head of that home. Yeah. He's the head of the household. And that wives are supposed to obey their husbands in everything, just like the church is supposed to obey Christ in everything, and I'm not the one who wrote the word everything at the end of verse 24. That's what the Bible says at the end of verse 24. I didn't put it there, but a lot of people want to take that concept out, and they want to twist this, and let me tell you something. A lot of preachers don't have the guts to get up and preach the sermon that I'm preaching right now, and that's what's wrong with America today. That's what's wrong with our families today, is that a bunch of spineless preachers are refusing to get up and preach the truth because they're afraid that somebody's going to get offended by this. And this Amen. preaching will offend people, but it's the truth. Yes, sir. And if I'm not going to preach the truth, then I don't have any business being in the pulpit. Right, right. And we're turning to so many scriptures tonight that I have to look at this and say, well, if there's so many scriptures that talk about this subject, if there are so many chapters dedicated unto this subject, it must be an important subject. Today, there's a trend toward a lot more women becoming pastors and women becoming preachers. And I think part of this is just that our culture in general seeks to blur the lines between men and women. And so now, the roles of men are being taken over by women in many cases, and the roles of women are being taken over by men, and this is not God's will or God's plan. God has designed there to be a difference and a distinction between man and woman. He made them at the beginning male and female, and he does not want them to be meshed and, and intertwined and mingled. He wants there to be a clear difference. That's why he said that our clothing should be different.
as men and women. That's why he said that our hair should be different. We live different lifestyles as men and women. It's not that men are better than women. There aren't. It's not that men have more value than women. They don't. But rather, men and women have different roles in society, different roles in the church, different roles in a family, and we should not tell women to be like men in order to have the same value as men. You know, ladies, you can have the same value as men just by being a lady. You don't have to become like men in order to have value. And it's bizarre that this teaching is called feminism that tells women, if you want to be to your full potential, you must dress like a man. You must live like a man. You must go to work like a man. How is that feminist? It should be called masculism. You know, because it's telling women to be masculine. It's telling women to live as men. And it doesn't make any sense. But today, you know, the United Methodist uh, denomination, 50% of their pastors are women. Uh, today, the Baptist denomination in Brazil, the main Baptist denomination in Brazil, ordains women to be pastors of churches today. Uh, preachers like Joyce Meyer are, are famous and, and well-known and uh, are best selling authors and, and popular preachers today, and they come into churches and preach in the church. Is it biblical? Well, what does the Bible say? Look down at your Bible in 1 Timothy 2.11. And by the way, just, to, just a quick reminder, I'm not the author of the Bible. Okay, everybody remember that? Yeah, and it's funny how people will get upset at me, and I love what Moses and Aaron are constantly saying in the book of Numbers. Don't get mad at us. I mean, Moses and Aaron are constantly saying, who are we? Don't get mad at us. It's the Lord that you're mad at. It's the Lord. The Bible says, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.11, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor do usurp authority over the man be in silence. Now, flip over, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. A little bit later, I'm going to get into what type of instances and circumstances would be appropriate for a woman to, to uh, preach or prophesy, but we definitely know that it's not in the church. And we definitely know that it's not a public preaching ministry because look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 34. It says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman, for women to speak in the church. Now, isn't it just bizarre that we have these explicit statements in Scripture, and yet today, I just saw recently an advertisement for a seminary, and they're trying to uh, get women to come to the seminary, and they want them to train to be preachers. And it was an advertisement for women to come to seminary and to be trained to be a pastor, to be trained to be a bishop or an elder of a church. And what does the Bible say? The Bible's crystal clear on this. There's no debate. Well, what do you think about this debate about women? There is no debate. The Bible says that women are supposed to keep silence in the church. It is not, I mean, he, he says it so many different ways just to make sure that you don't misunderstand. He says, let your women keep silence in the churches. That's one way of saying it. But then just to make sure that you understood it, it's not permitted unto them to speak. Then, just in case you didn't get that, they're commanded to be under obedience. Does that sound like they're the ruler? If they're commanded to be under obedience? No. And the Bible says, let the elder, elder means pastor or bishop, let the elders that rule well be kind of worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Uh, the Bible's clear here that that position is not for a lady. It says in verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. And just in case you didn't get it the first three times, he says the fourth time, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, a lot of people will misunderstand this teaching and they'll say, well, are you saying that they just have to walk in the building and just be silent, that they cannot fellowship before the service? And they'll say, are you saying that they can't chit chat before the service? Are you saying that they can't sing the songs? Is that what you're saying? Well, here's what we have to keep in mind, a few things. Number one, first of all, the church is not the building. Church means congregation. So it's not saying that women are not permitted to speak in this building. 
It's saying that they cannot speak in the church, meaning the general assembly, the gathering, the congregation when we're gathered together. And another thing that I want you to note, flip back to 1 Timothy 2, just because I want you to lay eyes on this and, uh, and see it very clearly for yourself. If we go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, we can help understand what God's teaching. It says in 1 Timothy 2.11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. So therefore, obviously, before the service, before the, the congregation begins the service, there's chatting and talking going on. That's perfectly legitimate. And then when we all sing praises to God, of course the ladies should also lift up their voices and sing praises unto God. But wait a minute, when it's learning time, it's silence time. See what I mean? So what it's saying is that they are to learn in silence. And that's why it talks about in 1 Corinthians 14, 35, also what we just looked at. It says, if they will learn anything. It says, when the learning is going on, they are not permitted to speak. When the learning is happening, they are to be inside. When the preaching of God's word is taking place, it, first of all, it's not for a woman to be doing the preaching. And second of all, it's not for women to be speaking. Even, the Bible's really clear on this, even if they were to have a question, they, they are not to ask that question in the church, number one. And number two, even if they want to ask that question to their husband, they should wait until they get home. You know, they should not in the service be talking. And by the way, this is why I don't believe that women should say amen during the preaching either. Now, here's the thing. When, when the preaching is going on, women should not express their opinion about the sermon. And, and uh, even if it's a positive opinion. And of course, the heart is in the right place. Now, I did one time, I was preaching one time, and a woman actually disagreed with me in the middle of my preaching. You know, I, I said something and she said I was wrong. You know, and I, I kind of, you know, blew up a little bit. But anyway, uh, but you know, a, a lot, there could be times when a woman's just agreeing. And, and you know what? The heart's in the right place, of course. But in reality, if we're gonna be true to scripture, then basically we would say, okay, when it's time for learning, that's a time for women to keep silence. That's a time to learn in silence. And again, this is not being down on women. This is not being down on anybody. We love women at our church, but we need to follow scripture and understand that this church has been, is, and always will be a, a man-run church. And it's a church that's led by a male pastor and of course, uh, we should uh, seek to make sure that we stay a million miles from this uh, doctrine of a woman preacher or, or women usurping authority over men or, or teaching and so forth.